Have you ever wanted a pinball machine in your house but didn't have a great spot for one? Well, that's where I'm at. So I thought, what if I could fit a pinball machine into a coffee table and still be able to play it? A pin table. This project is a massive undertaking filled with awesome design challenges. But I knew that if I was going to put this much effort into a project, I had to start with the perfect game. I reached out to my friend Angelo over at Pinball Vancouver and we researched games dating back as far as the 1970s, eventually settling on early solid state games from the 1980s. He put out his feelers and two months later, we had our game. Bally Centaur. Only 3,700 of these games were produced back in 1981. This game was designed by Jim Patla with legendary artwork by Paul Ferris. So before I can actually start my pinball table project, I need a pinball rotisserie or a pin tisserie. It's a common tool of the trade. There's plenty of designs out there, but I decided to build my own and you can actually play the whole pinball machine while it's on the stand. Cause I'm gonna need to get into all sorts of places to restore it, but also to re-engineer some solutions in order to make this thing fit into a table. The first major design challenge in this pinball build is to remove what is called the back box, which normally houses all the circuit boards and all the score displays. Since our pinball table will not have a back box, we need to relocate the circuit boards and figure out a way to display all the scores somewhere on the playfield. Viewing one of these score displays with the camera reveals how each digit is only displayed briefly, starting from the left and moving to the right. This process is happening so fast to our eyes that it appears like all the digits are on simultaneously. Decoding the scores proved to be a really tough challenge. It involves sampling 17 different signals in real time in order to be able to clock in just one new digit. I worked closely with a good friend of mine and we were able to make our own display decoder chip using the open source TinyFPGA BX board. The display decoder chip then talks to a Teensy 4.1 microcontroller. So the soundboard on my Centaur machine has never quite worked, but after giving it a bath in the ultrasonic cleaner, replacing some 40 year old dried out capacitors, a blown regulator, and a bunch of other components, it's now back in action and it sounds amazing. There are two main chips running on this board, which are responsible for generating sound. One is the AY38912, which generates tones, but the real gem is the TMS5200 Speech IC from Texas Instruments, which is a very close relative to what was in the original Speak and Spell. All of the actual sound data is stored on these UV erasable memory chips, which you can actually see the silicon through the quartz viewing window. Very cool. In order to capture all of these glorious sounds, I set up two bench supplies and an Arduino, which can increment through all of the available sounds. All of that is routed to the original speaker and also to my sound card. The old circuit boards have seen a ton of repairs from blown components and broken traces. Fortunately, Nitro Pinball agreed to sponsor this build by supplying a full range of replacement boards which require less space and have newer and more efficient components. Aside from replacements and upgrade parts, Nitro Pinball is also a distributor for massive pinball titles from Stern and Jersey Jack Pinball. Be sure to check out their site which can be found in the description of this video. Instead of buying replacement drop targets, I decided to model my own with the graphics directly embossed on them. They were then given a coat of epoxy for smoothing and durability. New plastics were hand cut out of a sheet of acrylic, sanded and polished, 
to replace the old yellowing plastics. Thank you to Comet Pinball for supplying over 100 LEDs to replace the incandescent bulbs. They have a massive selection of replacement bulbs available in every color, including three different tones of white and multiple brightness levels. They also carry a lot of custom lighting mods, so I picked up this trough lighting kit. And if you're interested in checking out their stuff, you can find a link to their site in the description below. All of the remaining parts from the original machine are being donated to a friend to help with his restoration of a Centaur pinball machine. So the next step of this project is we've got to weld up a base, and that's going to be made out of mild steel. I'm here at a friend's house, he's got a welder, so we're going to get to it. So I made my own cable management system out of aluminum T-channel. I'm hoping this is going to stop the wires from fraying when the drawers are moving in and out constantly during development and then later during its life when it's being serviced. I originally picked up these linear actuators off of AliExpress, and after playing with them and experimenting with them quite a bit, I realized the quality is just not up to par. The gears grind and there's a lot of play in the actuators when the rods are fully extended. I reached out to Progressive Automations and they agreed to sponsor this build by supplying me with two of their PA09 mini linear actuators. And there is a major build quality improvement here. These linear actuators can lift 300 pounds each, they run a lot smoother, a lot quieter, and the rods are made out of stainless steel. Progressive Automations carries a wide range of linear actuators for very different and specific applications. If you're interested in learning more about their products, the link to their website is in the description of this video. At this point, the test version of the cabinet is done. The linear actuators are now ready to be mounted and we can actually try lifting this thing for the first time. I finished up modeling the custom apron in Fusion 360 and had it sent out to be cut on a water jet. This thing uses 60,000 pounds of pressure and can cut through 16 gauge steel like butter. The apron was then formed into shape before being given to a local auto body shop who gave it a coat of gloss black paint. The kind folks over at CustomRubOnTransfers.com have supported my project by supplying me with one of their custom two-tone decals. I laid out all the graphics myself using Inkscape, borrowing inspiration from the original cabinet artwork, and introducing a few of my own little tweaks. After submitting my design, we worked through a few points to ensure that the decal could be made and that it would be something that I'd be happy with. CustomRubOnTransfers.com also carries a few of the optimal tools used to apply these decals. Here I'm going to be using the multi-tool burnisher. This is the first time for me, so I'm a little nervous, but here goes nothing.
I want to take a break from coding today and switch my attention to working on the final cabinet. I'm going to be using plywood edging throughout the construction because it looks great, but it also pays homage to pinball's use of plywood throughout its long history. So I've already measured and marked the locations for all of these chrome studs which are placed on the outside of the cabinet. Now all that's left to do is drill over 700 holes while the cabinet is still apart and in pieces and can be easily fit into the drill press. So I've taken some photos, turned those into vector files, and then played with the cabinet artwork inside of Inkscape. I then reached out to Wrap Guys, who are a full service car wrapping shop, and they put their printers to work producing these beautiful vinyl decals. You can check out Wrap Guys and some of the amazing wrap jobs they've done on vehicles in the links in the description of this video. Well, I've been coding for days and everything is finally up and running. When you're ready to start a game, three button presses are required to make sure you don't accidentally start the game and tip over anything that's on the top of the table. So the angle of the play field, how steep it is, determines how difficult the game is. And that's now a setting. The dial up front is used to set the desired angle and control all of the new settings. This includes speaker volume, display modes, diagnostics modes, and Tetris mode. When placed in Tetris mode, the playfield goes to the max incline of 8 degrees when a player's ball is taking too long. A 6-axis accelerometer has been installed and used to set the playfield angle. It also gets rid of these old, finicky analog sensors. There's still no cheating allowed, as the accelerometer is constantly monitored and will still end your game if you bump it too hard. The pin table is also equipped with a safety sensor, made from copper tape which can sense human contact. In the event any hands are present when lowering the table back into coffee table mode, the safety feature triggers, raising it back up, leaving hands intact. I removed the original mechanical plunger because it's shaped like a weapon and it can easily be kicked. Instead, the knocker solenoid has been repurposed to launch the ball back into play. When a ball is ready to launch, the skull's eyes on the apron light up and pressing the button on the front launches the ball back into play.
When I first started this project, I was told I was lighting money on fire, performing sacrilege, doing dumb things for Instagram likes, or perhaps my favorite, turning a Corvette into a couch. But in the end, I'm super proud that I was able to will this project into existence with the help of some friends. So if you have a crazy idea, ignore the noise and see it through. You'll be glad you did. If you would like more details about this project, I've written a technical blog post which you can find a link to in the description of this video. As always, consider subscribing to the channel as it only encourages this kind of behavior. That's it for this one, and thanks for watching.